Hello and welcome back to part two of this evening. I'm so excited uh, and so, yeah, just so taken away by the panelists and what's going to be coming up very shortly. Um, I just wanted to give uh, our friend Wando Ibize a big shout out from Witch. Uh, Wando Ibize's new project, Distorted Constellations, Volume 2, A Visual Snow Alternate Reality by Wando Ibize. Wando Ibize is a multidisciplinary Afrofuturist exploration of neurodivergency inspired by the artist's experience living with visual snow syndrome. Art, music, technology, neuroscience and black Atlantic ritual cultures connect across a 360 degrees short film and bespoke Instagram filter. There's a link in the chat now if you want to explore this project and look at all of the links and check out the bespoke Instagram filter and the 360 degree film. And Wando, we are big fans of you. We absolutely adore you. Uh, I was trying out the filter a little bit earlier when we were doing our tech check and absolutely fantastic work. Thank you so much. Now, before I read everybody's bios and I sort of, you know, talk you through the procedure of the panel, I just want to go into why I think electronic and music and clubbing is so important. So I started going out to clubs in London when I was about 14 years old. And I also began my DJ career when I was 17. I started DJing classical music when I was 17. And I ended up supporting Pulp and opening up for Golf Rap. And in club culture, this is where we find our tribe. I'm really not a fan of calling people's acquaintances. I think it's very, very cold. Um, over the years through the clubs that I've DJed in and that I've been lucky enough to co-found um, or to be a resident DJ or a resident performer, there have been hundreds of people that I've nodded at and smiled at and shared a dance floor with and shared drinks with over the years. And hundreds of them to this day, was that we still follow each other on Instagram, on TikTok, on YouTube. And just sharing that communal space is not superficial for me. I've watched people grow in their careers, grow in their artistry, watch them get married, watch them have children, watch them transition in their gender identity and take on and progress it in so many ways. And club culture is so vital and so needed. It was one of the things that's made me feel so sad about being in lockdown is just being able to dress up and go out at night and share great music and look at other people's looks. Like this is not superficial stuff. You know, dreams happen on dance floors. Uh, people meet each other. They strike these psychological deals uh, with one another. You know, the the seeds of projects are born on dance floors. Love is born on dance floors and it is by no means superficial. And this is why I really wanted to have a panel that reflected my past in, in many ways. And also with well-being very high on the agenda for everybody, you know, we've all been very isolated. Um, I've been particularly inspired to try and find a balance of those two things. And I'm so grateful to Nimone and Hannah Holland and Samantha Tony for agreeing to be a part of this panel. So how it's going to work is we're going to have about a panel of about 45 minutes and then there'll be 15 minutes for questions. Please make sure that you post your questions into the Q&A. We will not be taking questions from the chat. Um, and I'll be reading some of those out um, once the 45 minutes is, is up. And I just want to read you the bios of our panellists. We start with Nimone. Nimone has been a broadcasting for a quarter of a century with the last 20 years at the BBC, Radio 1, Radio 2, 5 Live and BBC Radio 6 Music. Her passion for electronic music led her to curate a weekly specialist show, Electric Ladyland, for the last decade. She now, jo she now hosts her Journeys in Sound series, taking a deeper dive into our relationship with music and its effect on the mind, body and soul. It's excellent. Nimone holds a Master's in Integrative Psychotherapy and Counselling and sees clients weekly. 
During the pandemic, she promoted breathing and grounding exercises as part of supporting well-being. And you can find her mini meditations at mixcloud.com forward slash Namone, which should appear in the chat now. Namone is currently collaborating with the Scottish Ensemble on a performance piece about how music might be implicated in transcendental experiences and the necessity of those experiences in a rational world. Hannah Holland. Hannah Holland is a worldwide DJ, producer, composer and label boss from London with releases on classic music company Crosstown Rebels, her own imprint Batty Bass and has remixed the likes of Metronomy, Golf Rap, The Knife and Planning to Rock. She regularly plays at clubs such as the Carry Nation in New York, Bergain, Panorama Bar Berlin and Adonis London. Outside of Clubland, she works on theatre, installation and film music, as well as playing bass for the black band, for the band Black Gold Buffalo. Later scores have included Channel 4 series Adult Material and award-winning indie feature Electrician. Hannah's much anticipated debut album Tectonic is coming out on Pra Recordings in 2021. The latest release, Midnight Horizon on Pra Recordings. Oh, I'm reading a random link. Sorry. Um, but yes, amazing. Samantha Tony. Artists need to be interdisciplinary. In the case of Samantha Tony, the Italian DJ producer and promoter is the word interdisciplinary personified. Founder of the Boudicca platform for women and non-binary folk in techno, Samantha curates a monthly radio show on threads of the same name in tandem with promoting Boudicca events at Pickle Factory, where she invites established and upcoming artists to soundtrack the intimate space. After the success of Boudicca Music Conference, Streamed from Freemasons Hall in November last year, she swiftly secured a second date for the conference in October 2021. Recently signed to Raw Agency, she is set to release an EP on the Raw imprint in 2022 and contribute to its forthcoming VA with a searing track in the pipeline. Further releases on PLS.UK and Obscure will drop in the months ahead and on the DJ front, Samantha's 2021 Summer Diary includes Stintsat, Ministry of Sound, Colour Factory and Orange Yard. Just a quick reminder, we'll have a Q&A after this panel. Please do post them in the Q&A chat box and I will leave the panel Electronic Music and Wellbeing. I will leave them in some Nimone's soothing hands. Are you there, Nimone? Hi. Yes, I am. Welcome. Thank you very much, Bishy, and welcome to our panel on well-being and electronic music. I am Nimone, and as Bishy just said, I'm DJ producer and broadcaster who you may have heard on the BBC and beyond Six Music more recently with my Journeys in Sound programme delving deeper into the relationship between music and our mind, body and soul. I am also integrative psychotherapist, working with clients on a weekly basis. And I am mum of two, very soon to be 12 and 10. Now, we call this well-being in electronic music as opposed to mental health in electronic music because I prefer the term well-being to mental health. I don't think in terms of mental health or ill health or uh, unwell or but just as it so it's not binary we're more on a kind of multifaceted multi-direction matrix type thing with our well-being in any one moment now electronic music in the past has seemed like an area that time forgot in terms of mental health and well-being late nights working playing hard varying working patterns isolation all coming with the job and accepted as part of the way that artists have to operate in this world thankfully more recently people have started to voice concerns raise their hands and seek a more nurturing and open environment for artists, DJs, producers, workers in the nighttime industries and clubbers. 
There is a mental health guide put together by Mind with Ninja Tune, Paradigm, Percolate Music and Polly, acknowledging that although working within electronic music obviously has its advantages and enjoyments, and we all know how we have enjoyed in the past, at least being in clubs and going clubbing, it does come with its own unique set of pressures. Long hours, acute stress, more ready exposure to drugs and alcohol, isolation and insecurity. So their guide was designed to help artists managers actually to cope with the responsibility of looking after artists. It's a really interesting read covering areas like setting health boundaries or healthy boundaries, tackling drug and alcohol abuse, understanding imposter syndrome, coping with working away from home. And that was published this time last year actually as the pandemic hit. And I will put that link uh, and I have put that link on the Witch Resources page, which I'll signpost to you a little bit later. There is a fascinating article published a couple of years ago by two outreach workers in Serbia about the rise of clubbing in cities like Belgrade and the need to talk about drug taking and potential experiences of depression and low mood. Connected to drug taking, but also the socioeconomic situation, which found kind of young Serbians not feeling very hopeful about the future. In that article, they do talk about the escapism we feel when we go clubbing, the escape from reality, the sense of togetherness, and the joyful shared experience that clubbing, uh, that clubbing offers. And that's echoed by an article that I found that was published late last year in which the author had uh, titled, I used to complain about nightclubs, but a generation's mental health depends on them. And she was pointing out how at that point, only two and a quarter million pounds of the 1.5 billion UK government funded coronavirus support package went to arts and culture institutions. But how clubbing provides an escape from everyday life, it provides community. Um, and it's difficult to replicate that when we're locked down with socially distanced uh, and needing to be socially distanced. So festival wise, we're giving it a good go with which to replicate something uh, of a community. Um, that we remember in festival going and clubbing. So clubbing and electronic music involve community. They can offer escapism and validation. Clubbing is a lifeline we've missed, but fortunately elements of the electronic music industry have been able to continue. The music obviously, like the beautiful work of Nali and Lula XYZ that you saw earlier, they've been able to happen and flourish in some cases during the last 12 months. So let's spend some time now thinking about well-being and electronic music how we think and talk about it, whether we're talking enough about it even, and how artists and electronic music can take care of themselves during a pandemic and beyond. Now, I just wanted you to know that our conversation this evening may include discussions about experiences relating to sexual harassment or assault, financial difficulties and discrimination of all forms, all issues, of course, involved in well-being. We would welcome any questions, like Bishy said, um, so add those using the Q&A and Bishy will feed those through to Hannah, Samantha and I later. And that brings me nicely to my guests. I am thrilled to be joined by queer club scene DJ and label boss Hannah Holland and Italian DJ and producer Samantha Tony. So we thought we'd kick this off by briefly doing a quick check in on the last 12 months or so as a kind of litmus test for well-being and get more into electronic music and well-being more broadly after that. So Hannah and Samantha, Welcome. It is lovely to have you both here. And Hannah, we'll, we'll start with you, actually. I mean, where to start? Tell us a bit of background about what the last 12 months have been like, work-wise, well-being-wise, and how that related to your general sense of well-being pre-pandemic. Hello, everyone. Um, yeah, it's been, it's just been such a crazy, mad roller coaster. Um, for everyone and, and it's just wild how I think everybody's had such a different experience as well um, like personally when the pandemic started like I was just getting ready to play at Bergheim the closing set which is like training for a marathon it's like preparing for like 12 hours of non-stop music um, oh. and um, much as that is the ultimate honour to play, it was really overwhelming because I'd only just been told about it like a couple of days before and I was kind of coming off the back of another gig and then going on to another gig. So it was quite a kind of weird jolt halt. Um, and so, when, yeah, when it came to stop, it was in terms of like kind of for myself personally, like the last many years have just been like non-stop in it and um and yeah kind of during the last sort of 15 years really just kind of like I had various points of sort of burnout and it's funny what you were saying about the um not funny but it's interesting what you were saying about 
all the sort of talk about well-being in in electronic music like literally there was there's like I'd never heard of any of that um before now so it's such important and interesting conversations um but it but but so in that in that terms it was actually like quite an amazing moment to sort of gather this sort of like wild ride that I'd been on that I'm incredibly grateful for and just kind of stop and just go like whoa okay like try and like absorb it um and you know I yeah and and I actually kind of like enjoyed the like staying in and kind of getting into um work in in terms of music um and getting into a routine and doing exercise and doing meditation and doing all the things and just kind of like getting that kind of like yeah all the things you need to do to sort of like really balance your mental health um and that really worked for me um and I and I ended up um at the beginning I um, created a compilation of my label Batty Bass. It was 12 years old this year, last year. Mm. Uh, and it was kind of like a full stop on it, really. It was a sort of um, a real love letter to the whole thing. Um, and it was really nice to be able to do that and um, shared loads of archives of that and went through all of it. So it was really nice to process that. Um, mm. And then, yeah, we started working on just other material um, did the score for adult material, which I'd done pre-pandemic, but we released the album and the, the show came out. Um, and then, yeah, then I started on my own album, which was quite a sort of journey of exploration and um, yeah, just kind of like really going into like, yeah, just kind of a journey within to myself and sort of like a, a sort of memoir of my past and something looking into the future and it was it was quite a magical experience to do that and I was doing things like going into my studio and like meditating every day and then working and um yeah so it's yeah and so in that respect and I I moved to Margate about five years ago so I've I'm in the beautiful beach town. Um, it's an amazing community of artists and stuff here. So in terms of like location and being able to go out, I have a dog every day I was on the beach, you know, whether it was cold or not. So I'm very, you know, blessed to have had that because seeing the sea and the sky and everything is just such a, so good for your well-being. Um, mm. um, so yeah, it's been quite um, a positive experience in that sense. Um, in the negative sense, um, dealing with family who have uh, a mother who's have, who's got de dementia and that's getting progressively worse through this time. So that's been really hard to sort of witness that, for, mm. you know, be able to be there all the time. Um, and obviously the sort of financial fallout as well, but luckily had help from various schemes and stuff. Um, so yeah, just lots of different things. Um, I feel really grateful that I've been able to like be creative for sure. Well it's interesting isn't it you you sort of touched on there an element that I'm sure we'll come back to later which is it, it sounds that electronic music pre-pandemic could be quite relentless and that's sort of the the image I think and also the experience of lots of people which is there's not so much time to digest what's going on as you're doing it even if you were making it would be I mean it'd be interesting to think about what it would have been like to make the album you've made this year in the last 12 months in, in a time when you were you know perhaps going off to DJ at Bergen and not having the time to meditate in your studio yeah it, it would have been a totally different experience yeah it's wild like the yeah I mean a lot of what I've been trying to do is just kind of like I want to really like digest what mm. I've been through because it has been like incredible and I've been around the world and yeah, but like, you know, at, this, at that level where, you know, I've got friends who are like in America and then they're like in South America and then in Cuba, like in, in or not wherever, in like in a weekend. And it's just like, what? Yeah. Well, we'll I mean, we'll come on to that kind of um, the er erratic work pattern and what it's like. I mean, because you've been in it since your teens, what that's been like and the kind of effect that that's had. Samantha, I wanted to come to you now and sort of, talk us through your pandemic year well-being wise and give us an idea of the impact and how you were feeling just over a year ago and and and, and how you are now 
Yeah. Hi, everyone. And um, I can relate a lot with what Hannah said, for sure. I think personally, for me, it's been a year of learning a lot about myself and uh, what I want to prioritize in a way. And first of all, uh, as you were saying, it's, it's definitely my well-being. So I'm make, like, I've been making sure I've been meditating, I've been exercising, I've been eating good food, I've been sleeping well, etc. So in a way, it's a bit scary because it's just like, how am I going to combine this with Friday, Saturday, gigging, sometimes midweek as well, traveling, etc. So I think for uh, traveling musicians, it's 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 quite tough because mm. I found even just for my own well-being, how how important it was to have a routine and uh, just like cook fresh food, etc. You know, just like not getting like food from like the first place I find in the airport because I'm in a, in a rush. So mm-hmm. it's been a definitely a year of learning what my priori- priorities are. And I think as well, um, looking at the current climate as well in the last two mo- 12 months, I think that's what people have experienced a lot because uh, especially in regards of like all the uh, political topics that have been discussed in the last 12 months, I think people stopped and really thought about what are the really important things, what are the things that matter and like who is suffering more than me and how, how can I contribute to their well-being and that's kind of like what in my very small world I've been trying to do as well, like I run a platform uh, called Bodica, which is a platform that aims to give visibility to women, non-binary and trans artists in music. And uh, um, I've been promoting a lot of uh, well-being. I've been sharing as well um, how I feel, which in the past I've been struggling quite a lot. I think I had this idea of myself that it was just, just this very strong character. And I always felt a little bit ashamed sometimes of feeling like of sharing like how I felt. So it's been like definitely uh, an amazing year of reconnecting with myself. And um, also in a way, I think my identity um, was really conjuncted to being an artist. Whilst this year, I kind of was stripped down from it. So I was like, it was just my pure self in my room thinking and, you know, like exercising, etc. So definitely I reconnected a lot to who I really am, aside of music, which obviously it's, it's my life. But I think it was very important because at one point I found myself without it and I was like, damn, like, I don't know who I am. So it was, it, it was a long, long process. And uh, yeah, like very creative, sometimes not creative at all. I worked, uh, as Hannah was saying, on a lot of new music. And, uh, but I think the, the real journey was um, like inside like for me this year for sure so what was that like in in the sense of you know having your kind of identity like you say stripped away which was the performance side of it to rediscover or reconnect with I mean you've talked a lot about how actually this year has shown how 24 7 the nighttime industry and electronic music can be and like you say with that stripped back what was that like to to rediscover yourself It's a challenge because I didn't have any distractions in a way because living this fast life of uh, DJing and going out and then uh, it's it's a 24 seven job, like it's social media. And then if you're not DJing that night, perhaps you will go and check out the the nights of your friends or it's a, it's a constant, it's a, it's a distraction. It's an amazing distraction because it's passion, but at the same time, that's, where it becomes a little bit dangerous in a way because it's passion, but at the same time it's work. So when do you draw the line? Mm -hmm. So, and even these years told me a lot about um, scheduling time where I make music, where I listen, when I'm listening to music. Uh, Sometimes, you know, like free time is away from a screen. It's not watching like another DJ set (laughs) because like, I know this is passion, but in a way it's still connected to the work. So this really told me on how like have my my free time, my downtime for sure, even if it has been tough, but yeah, I had to be like quite strict. Well, it's, I mean, it sounds there like you're kind of describing 
putting some more boundaries in actually which is, yeah. you know we often talk about in therapy in terms of okay I love all these things but you know how, how much of all of these things can I do and what actually is the fallout when I when I try and get everything in um, so we'll come and, and it and it also sounds like both of you are discussing kind of elements of self-care so we'll, we'll we'll kind of circle back to those a little bit later on and see kind of maybe I, I don't like this word top tips or sort of kind of ideas of, of your favorite things to do when you're kind of knowing that you're needing some self-care Hannah I wanted to come back to you and say at the beginning of the discussion I, I've said for a long time I thought that health, mental health and well-being was kind of like a dirty word in the electronic music industry it doesn't feel like it featured a lot before you know uh, in, in in the sort of intervening decades till now how do you think well-being has been approached in the past in the industry if indeed it was and do you think that is changing do you feel something kind of shifting um i i honestly can't ever remember it being discussed apart from when you know people would really sort of like lose themselves um mm -hmm. i think the great thing about more many more women becoming and non-binary people coming into the industry more and more and more means that these things are discussed because I think the sort of very sort of male kind of culture uh, it is a lot of that was to do with like just full-on kind of hedonism as well and I was I was fully up for that like um for, for a good part of my maybe sort of late teens to late 20s um and then a bit after but you know i was, I was a foot fully there you know um but there there is definitely a kind of um a uh there, there's definitely a moment where things need to shift in order for you to keep sane essentially um and it's at that point is like where do you for me it was about you know i was a lot of um self strength to sort of say no to um to drugs um and realize realizing that every time i was going out and djing and going out it would involve that you know and it was a sort of really real realization i actually got very ill at one point mm. um, and yeah it was a real wake up call to be like okay this this you can't just keep doing this but that that was that was definitely something that that I came, you know, I had to figure that out for myself, basically. Um, and also seeing seeing older um, friends, DJ friends who were maybe 10 years older than me, um, kind of getting into, you know, going to rehab and stuff and just thinking, oh my God, you know, like, is that is that the future? Um, so um I've, I've i've forgotten what my question what the question was where am i going with this <laughs> um it, I, it, well i i wanted to kind of come back in anyway it was sort of about whether well-being feels like it is more in the conversation now in yeah. our industry than it than it perhaps it was a few years ago i mean the, there's no doubting that the industry is has been male dominated continues to be male dominated and and i suppose it may feel like that is actually one of the driving forces for the hedonism but I also think actually it's it's worth saying that th there's something about how young you are when when you kind of necessarily start mm -hmm. that clubbing journey that also feels like it's connected to oh my god I want as many experiences as I possibly can have yeah um that feels like it's worth throwing into the mix at that point as well but yeah I suppose it was really around well-being being more kind of I don't know permissible or, or sort of um okay to talk about now yeah for sure and um I think yeah I think I think everybody's talking about it you know it's sort of um it's it's uh it's it's a really welcomed welcome um conversation definitely um and you I mean you I think when we spoke earlier you you've talked about insomnia and and the impact of the irregular work pattern kind of lasting a long time so just is that still with you is that something that you think yeah. Yeah, I've I've had it for around I've had it for about ten years plus, um, and it sort of started. It started at a moment where I was kind of deciding where I was I made a massive shift in 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 my work. Like I I, I sort of was doing let decided to do less DJing and sort of focusing more 
on working in other areas like I was doing youth work music with youth work um and yeah it, it that shift suddenly I started getting insomnia like um a lot and it's and it's still with me and it I think it's I mean it I yeah I, I it's hard to know where it comes from but when you kind of think about you know if you're flying to a gig and you go to the hotel and you sleep for you have a little disco nap for like two hours and then your alarm goes off at one or one or two in the morning and it's like Whoa! you know like your and your and your adrenaline is like you know I can be awake fully I can be completely deeply asleep and then fully awake and ready to like be in front of x amount of people playing you know loud crazy music um so obviously that must you know years of that must really affect your sleeping um but yeah so it's something that I I still have and that I'm sort of trying to tackle now you've got actually we'll come back to the resources uh, kind of pack and and links that we've got but I think you've got some yeah. around sleeplessness and yeah. uh, insomnia and Samantha tell us a bit more about your route into electronic music in Italy and what attitudes were like there to inclusivity and well-being because I think we've spoken about that being um, yeah yeah I, th I think like um recently like I've, I've started to you research a lot also because of my platform into like the different organizations that support people in music and uh i coming from a country like italy where people are not talking about well-being in music but they're not talking about well-being at all in a way um so i was so impressed about the amazing organizations the amazing work that has been done in the uk um as you as you were saying before there's a there's a link um to all the great organizations etc but yeah I, I think it's it's I mean I was so impressed about like the 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 sources that we have that are completely free or on low income so uh, this country is great uh for for uh, well-being etc 100 percent and uh, going back to what we were saying before about like talking about uh, well-being and music etc I think it's so important and it's amazing how many people are speaking up about it and uh, we need more role models as well uh, not just about like um, talking about like in a way like we need more more real role models as well they talk about the struggle and uh, I think it's so important so people can relate um, I find myself talking to uh people on Instagram a lot about it and I think just by sharing it like they say uh, a problem shared is a is a problem half right so even just by sharing with other people I think just makes you feel a little bit less heavy in a way it's a it's a strange time now like we we're all suffering in a way um so it's hard sometimes to kind of like um identify the ones that are uh, struggling more right now so I think it's so important that we keep on talking about it and and yeah and we keep on like sharing like the knowledge for example uh the different organizations that are available out there so yeah mm, and and you founded obviously Boudicca which you said earlier the collective to give more visibility to women and non-binary artists mm. tell us mm -hmm. more about the premise under which that was founded and what you've kind of learned about the experience I mean uh, of women and non-binary artists through the collective definitely so i i founded it in 2019 so it's a it's a new organizations and uh i wanted to encourage more underrepresented genders in music to become involved in the music industry so i i'm also a teacher i teach at the london sound academy where i tutor sound design mixing and mastering and i found a lot of women, a lot of women, lots of non-binary trans people coming to me and just um, just telling me about how they felt so intimidated by the industry, and um, and looking back as well as at, at my own experience, uh, I didn't really have anyone to relate to. Like looking up as a more uh, um, kind of real role models because you know we have the the big role models so the the, the pop stars etc but the more um um up and coming the medium artists like uh even like 10 years ago were a little bit harder to find so so yeah it was it was uh born to kind of encourage more 
underrepresented genders to more under more underrepresented people to become involved in the industry and we operate under different mediums we are a um, record label so soon to be and a, a series of events a radio show a mm -hmm. podcast and last year we launched as our first music conference as well where we talked about well-being and disparity of genders in the music industry etc so yeah it's um it's it's definitely dr driven by my passion, which is music, education, and uh, women and non-binary and trans people in music. Yeah. Now, Hannah, that leads us beautifully on to kind of talking a bit more about your experience and, and kind of how, I mean, does that resonate what Samantha's saying there about, you know, the, the number of people coming to her saying, actually, we, you know, we, it's, it's intimidating. It's, just, it's not necessarily welcoming kind of space. To, yeah to, to get into yeah definitely um yeah i've definitely taught um like young teenagers who like girls who are just like just want to dj they love it but they just immediately say well it's not for me and it's like that's in 2020 or when it, you know what 20 whatever it's like what <laughs> not the case um but i feel in i mean so lucky to have come up through the queer scene um, and mm. the, you know, where the community that I sort of first started DJing in um, was so, you know, so supportive um, and inclusive and it, and it was very mixed as well, which was, um, mm. the dance floor was mixed. Um, there, there were more, there were other, you know, female trans DJs as well um, and, uh, I, I've, I feel so grateful to have had that sort of platform to to feel to be able to like express myself and be you know be allowed to just kind of feel comfortable there and, and have a crowd who were completely dedicated like through doing residencies and stuff um, and I think if I hadn't have come through that scene it would be a different story because um, I think um, yeah, it's just it's just not like that in a sort of straighter world, unfortunately. Well, I, I was going to say to you, because you started in your teens as well, is there some element of almost kind of growing up in the industry or kind of that that scene helping kind of you feel more comfortable in yourself just generally? Yeah, I mean, I started, I would say I started clubbing in my teens. <laughs> yes. when, when, very young, when I was about 13, 14. Um, uh -huh. I grew up in London, so I, I was, you know, getting a bus to um, whatever club um, from a very young age. So, I, yeah, I did grow up in nightclubs. Um, mm -hmm. I, I started DJing when I was about 19, and then I, I started being able to sort of make a living out of it mid-20s, like 24, 25. Um, but um, sorry, what was the question? Growing up, well, and well, and that thirteen-year-old going clubbing was yeah. that sort of at that point were you like that's something I could do, or did it feel like you know that was accessible, or or you know some some way you know you'd be able to make a career out of it, or that you wanted to head in that direction? Well, it certainly made me not give a flying about um, school because I was like. <laughs> Okay. <laughs> There's something way more exciting out there. Um, Careers office dodged. <laughs> That's where I want to be. Okay. Yeah, I, I just was, I just fell in love with it. It was so exciting. It was such a magical world. It was m incredible music. You know, it's just like a real place to, a place of acceptance as well. When you grow up as a sort of, as a queer kid, like, you know you find these clubs and they're j and you're suddenly able to see other people like you and feel free and have these experiences so I mean I definitely loved music so much that I wanted to touch it you know and that's why I bought ended up buying decks and literally being able to touch vinyl you know it was like I just wanted to be involved so much um that that's why I started DJing um but yeah, I mean, I I, I did I didn't really start off thinking I'm going to be a DJ. Um, it sort of it it just built up and built up, and it I had another career in in film actually in the beginning, and at, at, at a point in my mid twenties, it sort of 
did the DJing kind of totally took off so and that's amazing actually how it's come full circle back to film now isn't it yeah. that's lovely yeah yeah so we I mean I, I guess yeah I had a question about something about the community in 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 electronic music and and validation because what you're talking about is I I felt more comfortable because I was meeting people like me and seeing people like me and being accepted and that feels really important and something that actually we'll come on to later in terms of people not being able to go out and yeah. meet this year but I wanted to I just wanted to talk a bit about electronic music as an industry with clubbing as well as an environment to be a woman non-binary artist DJ or clubber and obviously there have been concerns raised about the conduct of several well-known DJs regarding inappropriate sexual behavior and assault up till quite recently so I sort of thought between the three of us we could kind of take a temperature check now and obviously that might be diff it's difficult because we haven't been out clubbing for the past 12 months so we're talking up until you know March last year but how would you say the industry greeted those accusations and how surprised were you by what was being said about some of the DJs abusing their position and power? H Hannah, we'll come to you first and Samantha, I'll come to you after that. Yeah, I was not surprised at all. Um, I thought that, I thought it was handled really well by um, D uh, like magazines like Mix Mag and DJ Mag. Um, they, they sort of broke various stories and they also created support um support um hotlines or whatever for people yeah. to, to talk about it um carl loban who who is the editor of dj mag is is very you know very on top of all of that um and but it didn't surprise me at all i mean i i've yeah i've i've ha you know i know friends that it, it that it's happened to um who have been raped by big name DJs um, and they have not been listened to. The police did not listen to them. The, they, they were silenced basically. Um, and they continued to be these big star DJs. Um, and it's just horrific, you know? So I'm, I'm pleased that there's been this light that has shed on, on these people. Um, and hopefully it means that they can't, you know, they, the, the, the people kind of think twice about it and the, these people I don't know it's I'm just glad that at least people are talking about it you know um, mm. I, yeah, I wasn't surprised no I, I, I agree similarly it's it's not something that seems surprising it what does seem surprising I suppose and having all of us been in electronic music for a while is the silence that has kind of accompanied it for the past you know 20 years or whatever um, and that it is high time that this was highlighted and um, uh, and people were heard and more. So Samantha, same to you really, um, how, how do you feel like the industry greeted those accusations? Mm. Do you feel like there was, um, yeah, and, and, and kind of how surprised um, you? Like, in a way, very disappointed by some because uh, personally, I think you, in, in these cases, you can't separate the artistry from the person, no matter how much you idolize someone musically, how much of a talent they are. I think um, what happened like has got no excuse whatsoever. So was very disappointed by uh, some of the big names uh, kind of just like, you know, putting the matter like under the carpet in a way. So, uh, but at the same time, uh, I was so proud by, you know, amazing initiatives like, for example, For The Music by Rebecca mm -hmm. and uh, other amazing initiatives as well uh, of like just brave victims coming forward. So mixed emotions, you know, very disappointed in a way, but very proud of people speaking up about it and sharing like uh, what the experience was, like just painful experiences in a way. So, so yeah, it's great as Hannah was saying is that in a way it's a good reality check as well for those like big names that think they are untouchable because now, you know, people start speaking up about it. And the more we speak about it, the more people, uh, the more solidarity, solidarity there is and the more people will feel 
stronger and coming forward. So definitely like it's very powerful what's happening, very painful and powerful at the same time. So it's great that people are speaking up about this. It's it's so important, especially in electronic music. I think in like uh, in club environments, etc., uh, people get away with too many things because everything is kind of uh, hidden by the drugs and the alcohol. I was drunk. I don't remember, etc. Like there is no excuse uh, for this. So it's good that um, people are talking about it for sure. And I was going to, this might be difficult to answer now because obviously we've not been in clubs for, for 12 months and it's difficult to, to, to get a sense of how things might change. But do you feel like there's been a shift in the industry's attitude to inappropriate sexual behaviour and that, it, and, and we're not just talking about big name DJs, but dance floors generally feeling safer, potentially? Definitely. I think... Um with the rise of safe spaces and collectives, I think that uh, people are educating themselves and are educating others as well in uh, in the matter. And um, yeah, I, I I hope I will see a shift moving forward, and not just in the queer clubs or the, for example, uh, with Bodica with a with a with a party I run, uh, we have some designated people from our team that were a badge. So in, if you don't wanna go to a security uh, person that perhaps uh, you won't feel as comfortable with, you can go to one of our staff members. And you know, if you like, if you don't feel like, if you feel uncomfortable, you know, something is bothering you, then you can go to these designated people. But I hope we can see in the big clubs and the big festivals, and it's a change that comes not just from the promoter, but to everyone involved. So this is my hope in the future. Mm. Well, on the subject of dance floors and clubs, I mean, again, we just don't know, do we? But the, there is a sense that we might have some return to some kind of live performance or some kind of experience. And that again may change as we're speaking. Um, but I wanted to ask you both about how you feel about returning to a live environment, bearing in mind everything we've said, and it, it does sound like or everything that's happened in the last 12 months has involved kind of a digestion and an understanding of perhaps the impact of the way that electronic music has been and perhaps a different way of being post pandemic. So Hannah to you first, what does it feel like looking into the future and thinking I might be in a live environment, I might be getting DJ, the Bergen gig might come back. What, what, what does all that feel like and how, how are you approaching it? It, it? it sort of feels quite abstract to be honest. Yeah. Um, I think I'm really excited to, to play m the music that I've been making like, out loud to people. Um, I mean, I'm really excited for that. Um, I, I, I got to be totally honest, like the thought of being in such a intense club mm. at the moment feels really overwhelming. Um, but at the same time, you know, once you get there, <laughs> you, yeah. It, you know, it, it it just feels so abstract right now. It feels like we're sort of, I don't know. I just can't imagine it. It's well, it's interesting because when we first talked about doing this panel together, we were kind of going, oh, you know, we might, you might be out in a club in, you know, in a month's time. Yeah. It even feels like that might be slipping out of our grasp and, you know, in the intervening two weeks since we first started talking about it, a couple of weeks. So I get, I get that it's, it's so abstract. And I think there's a, a general sense of, and some people are, are sort of desperate to have that intense experience and will be kind of running towards it. And some people will feel more, yeah. retis, you know, kind of like, I need to take it slower. Actually, I haven't been in that environment. And all we've been told is we can't, we can't be close together. What, you know, that will be an interesting change, won't it? To, mm. to experience. Definitely. Um, yeah. And Samantha, how, how about you? getting out <laughs> live playing some of, I mean both of you have created incredible music over the last 12 months I just wanted to say Hannah yes you must be excited about playing some of that album and Samantha you for the stuff that you've been producing as well 
I, I for one, can't wait to get into a live space to experience it. But how, how are you kind of approaching that? And what does it feel like looking at it from here now? I mean, I'm definitely excited. Obviously, it will feel quite strange the first 10 minutes. <laughs> but then... <laughs> You give yourself 10 uh, minutes. Like. Yeah, exactly. Just 10 minutes. And uh, I'm very excited to see everyone. I've been uh, uh, like, uh, I've been like me and my household, we've been quite strict uh, with uh, self isolation. So I haven't seen many of my friends for a very long time now. So definitely excited to see everyone. Mixed feelings because I will want to see everyone, but at the same time, I will want to be just right at the front of the speakers and just like just dance for eight hours straight and DJ, of course. So. Yeah, I'm excited and uh, I'm just very hopeful as well. A lot have been discussed in the last 12 months um, for music and equalizing music. So I'm hoping, hoping that all these amazing panels, discussions uh, will come to life and uh, everyone will make an effort and will make a music industry a better place. Yeah, I really think that it's, I totally agree with what you're saying. I think. That, yeah, like what that there's been so much political discussion and quality discussion, and you know, people saying this is not good enough. And I and I'm really excited to see um the change it's gonna bring because I, I just think that um yeah, having completely unequal lineups, whether it's race or women or whatever, is just not acceptable anymore. So um, mm -hmm. I think it's going to be a different, a really different um, yeah. industry when when it gets back. And yeah, and there's, as you said, there's there's no excuse anymore. So yeah. people need to make an effort, like festivals and promoters and bookers. It needs to come from everyone, you know, from yeah. the top to the bottom. 100%. And yeah, and it feels like this twelve months plus at the moment has given time for reflection, doesn't it? And the sense of a standing back and looking at an industry that that like we said in the beginning sort of didn't stop to to do that to kind of take its temperature check and 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 um and see where it was at in 2021 2020 um there's just time actually we'll come to questions very very shortly but i did want to ask both of you like i said i would about when or, or kind of what you've discovered are your kind of go-to self-care places, things? Hannah, it sounds like Margate has that in abundance anyway, so where you are kind of is part of that. But what would you say in terms of uh, a few things that, that we can take away that are your kind of go-tos in terms of looking after yourself and well-being? I think my probably number one is exercise. Um, and and the, my favorite thing, which I think is the most useful is running, you know, jogging, whether it's 10 minutes or half an hour or longer, but um, even just starting off just doing like five or 10 minutes, you know, something that's just manageable, like it does something to your blood, you know, it just is, is, so, is so good for your state of mind. Mm. Um, that was a game changer for me. Um, I also stopped, I mean, I had a period where I, I had about nine months of not drinking as well. And that was a game changer. I learned so much about myself. Um, I, I drink now, but I actually drink quite a lot less than what I used to. Mm. Um, I think eating well, of course, um, having a routine in the morning, um, which you stick to, just kind of really sets you up for the day. Um, and also just kind of like finding interest in other things, whether it's kind of books or going to see some art by yourself or going to see a film or just really just taking time just to do something for yourself that you love, that's not to do with your work or music or whatever, if you're in electronic music or if you're not, you know, it's just something that can, yeah, that, that you can really sort of, just switch off and just enjoy. Oh, they're, they're great shouts. And I think you're right, endorphins and running. And it doesn't have to be, um, you know, you can kind of start off walking, but actually just that sort of pace and getting out and then starting slowly to build it up. Um, it's a great shout. And Samantha, for you, how, how so, are your kind of go-tos in the, in the 
self-care sense? I mean, same as Hannah, top is uh, working out. That's something that for me just completely empties my mind in a good way. Uh, so definitely like that's something that I couldn't do without. It's my go to 100 percent. And uh, I do a small meditation as well every morning when I wake up that kind of like settles my day. And, and like some people like don't like meditation. It's not that like I completely like zone out like it's hard for me as well some days it's so hard that I'm just like my mind just goes running and running so even if I do it a lot like it's hard for me as well so uh but definitely it's something that you know I keep it it's every day for me and just like I start the day in a different way for sure and um I also like for whoever likes podcasts uh the inner truth on Spotify it's a amazing and there's a different guest each like couple of weeks each month and it's amazing there's a, actually a an episode with uh, James Cato from Faithless as well which is incredible like that's the first one I've ever listened to and I recommend it to everyone because it's great yeah. and uh nurture your uh, your uh, support network your friends and call your friends and just like you know tell them you love them and like all these small things that perhaps we take for granted but like especially this year my support network was so important to me it was so important so definitely I, I own them a lot um, and yeah just time away from the screens as well important um, uh, I'm, I've just finished reading the power of now just now which is amazing and, um, and another book uh, I read is why People Don't Heal and How They Can by Caroline Miss, which uh, I don't know if, if you pronounce her last name that way, it's M W double S. Uh -huh. uh, sorry, Miss Caroline. Uh, <laughs> but she's great. Like, watch her videos, she's incredible. So, yeah. Yeah. Cool. I, I would, Go on, Hannah. Go on. I, yeah. I, 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 The Power of Now is amazing. I, I read that a long time ago but another book that's really incredible is called The Artist's Way um, and it's a three month kind of process of sort of reconnecting to your artist self. Julia um, Cameron. Uh, yeah. yeah it's it's really powerful and incredible um, and yeah if you're an artist or if you feel like you're kind of wanting to get in you know explore your creative side it's kind of it really delves deep into this kind of like inner um creating creation like learning artist process wow yeah. i can yeah. yeah i agree i i yeah and it's set up in a kind of way that leads you through it doesn't it sort of like a process diary kind of yeah so easy to easy to kind of get into oh hannah and samantha thank you we're not going to stop there we are going to open up the discussion now uh bishy you've been kindly gathering questions during our discussion so should we take some of those now I'm going to hand back to Bishy for a moment now yeah sure I just wanted to thank all of you for just being so vulnerable and so open um you know as was mentioned it on the panel that we've all struggled and we've all suffered in our own way I certainly can vouch for that myself um, but I'm actually really private about the stuff that I say in public like what I say to my friends is like blah 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 but in, you know, putting it out there on a public panel is something else. So I was incredibly moved by everything that was said. So thank you to the three of you. I'm going to start with a question from Susan Langen from a platform called Wave Pass that I'm actually recording for next week. Um, and Susan asks, Hannah, are you looking to incorporate digestive periods as we come out of the pandemic's restrictions and work returns to greater frequency? Am I um, digestive periods? What to kind of? Um, yeah, I get. Yes, I guess so. Because sort of carving, carving out. Um, I, yeah, I'm sort of learning how to meditate on things and and digest things, and I'm finding sort of writing um, is really helpful, and and not kind of writing a novel, but um, just writing sort of stream of consciousness. Um, and meditating and I'll definitely be continuing that and um, that really helps with sort of digesting life yeah. that answers 
question. <laughs> ah, wonderful. Thank you. And this is from Jenny Rolling Stone. Two questions. First, how do you prioritize your wellness now, in brackets, self care? How do you approach scheduling ETC? Second, more specific, how do you protect your hearing making? How do you protect your hearing when making slash playing music? That's a very good question. So that could be the you know any one of you who who wants to lead on on that question. We go to Samantha. Yeah, sure. Um, I think right now what we we were saying before as well, like right now it's it's been a little bit easier to prioritize. The real uh, test will be after I think, but I'm really hoping I can take whatever I learned this year, for example, taking time off. And I'm a bit of a workaholic, so I've, I used to find myself kind of like making excuses like, oh, but this is not really work, so I can like, I can just do it. So, but now I just want to be more strict with myself and actually time off is time off. It's time where I spend it for like, you know, going to an exhibition, um, seeing my friends, but away from music, which is again, passion, love, but also work. So yes, yeah, so I think moving forward, definitely uh, just prioritize my me time and not just when I'm uh, literally running out of energy because that's what I used to do as well, a lot. Um, like uh, you need to nurture yourself all the time, even if when you're at, at, the, at the top, in my opinion. So, which is the harder, I think sometimes because you're like, oh, I feel great. You know, I don't have to do the work because, you know, I can just go on. I can work for like 14 hours. I'll be okay. So yeah, so definitely. And what was the second question again? Sorry. Oh, the second question. Oh, it's disappeared. But I think it was how you protect your hearing when you're making and playing music. Yeah. Um, I try as much as I can of wearing earplugs. I have custom uh, earplugs that are amazing. Um, and I try as much as I can to wear them when I'm in the club uh, because it's just so important. And uh, and in terms of the, when I work at from home in the studio, it's, it's harder sometimes because uh, you start by having like a very low volume. And then obviously like, you know, uh, the ears get tired so you increase increase and you don't even notice it so I try to have breaks so every hour five minutes break so kind of like I, I reset in a way so I think that works for me yeah. and I just wanted to say actually off the back of what Samantha was saying that that we know these things we know what's good for us and it's when we start to get really in the flow again so perhaps this period of downtime for lots of people has been a chance to reset and realize what's good for us so it might be useful to kind of, kind of talk to a friend about those sort of things that you know that are good for you and then they can go oh do you remember you said you really like doing the running or the working out or the meditation and and to sort of you know be able to have that conversation with someone who goes you might want to you might want to maybe just reset or check in with how much you're doing again um that can be really helpful if you have a kind of i don't know trusted friend or someone who who you know you can hear it from without feeling too cross when they go doing too much again <laughs> True. yeah there's a really great question from nita aviance as artist promoters who may now be a bit older and wiser, how do we create our great spaces of escapism and community for a younger audience without losing momentum to the cry of hypocrisy? What who wants to lead on that? <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, Bishy. Can you read the question again? And I'm just going to concentrate on the last bit. Say it again. <laughs> without hypocrisy. Yeah. Who here is wise? No, I'm joking. Um, yeah. <laughs> how do we create great spaces of escapism and community for a younger audience without losing momentum to the cry of hypocrisy? It's. I think it's. I think it's a. It's a. It's a really difficult moment to be like an older. I mean, I'm forty, and to be an older person within. Um, within the DJ world and knowing all of the madness that we've kind of been through in the past, Nita. Um, and, and, and to be, to be able to sort of, you know, see, see a young, a younger self or see, um, 
kids sort of going through it um, and be kind of like, yeah, I don't know. It's like if I had a kid who was like me, for instance, as a teenager, I would be like terrified. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, me. Yeah, likewise. Yeah. Same. <laughs> so, so um, yeah, I, I, how to create a space. I, I don't know. I mean, I think the kind of the ultimate knowledge of, of how to create um, a fantastic party um just just allows you to create an environment that is going to um nourish that i guess i think i'd just like to come in because i started clubbing 13 14 you know growing up in london i think that this is just what we do and the thing about the community and especially the queer community then is i was really looked over and and, and really looked after there was some pretty wild and rock and roll and shocking things going on and I was completely looked after. And so within all of this avant-gardism and, and, you know, like all this kind of activity going around, I knew that there was always someone who was going to put me in a taxi. There was someone who was either going to text my Nokia or my pager or whatever it was back then. And I think I, I personally, I felt like I was really looked after. Um, and that, you know, I'm I'm really lucky. I mean, you know, I was going out in Soho and, and and in East London. I think you grew up in Peckham, Hannah, did you? You were part of the Peckham crew. Yeah, right. OK. And so did you feel like you were being looked after and, and, and kind of nurtured? Or was there like a gang of like you, you and Alex Noble and, and, and Debo and like maybe I'm just like sort of saying stuff like, you know. Um, but yeah, did you feel looked after? Yeah, yeah, a hundred percent. And I think again, that is something that's so um, intrinsic to the queer community is that there's yeah. always that the elders who are looking after the, the the young ones. And I think you know that is definitely what us as olders see in in clubs and and you know always there to chat and just kind of like create environments that are safe and really fun. Um, and and also having the you know being able to have these conversations publicly as well was um, is so important. But yeah, I, I I'm totally with you, Bishy. Like I, I I had that experience as well, and really grateful for it. Yeah, and I've also had that moment of realizing like I am now the auntie. Um, there was a car full of young designers and club kids that I had to corral on the way to like an Elton John party at at the Tate and. I had to really kind of get everyone in and kind of, you know, just like pull everyone in and like make sure everyone had that. You know, it was it was just like, wow, I like I am now the auntie um, and I kind of secretly loved it. But yeah, like, have you had your auntie moment yet of like, you know, looking out over and 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 realizing that someone might be vulnerable or, you know, someone needs to be like herded into a special area or, you know, or like, are you yet to have your auntie moment? I've definitely had my auntie moment. <laughs> I've had my grandmother moments, Bishy and Hannah, and Samantha. I am much older than 40. Um, and I feel, I actually feel like I think that's something that we can bring. And I, I what I liked about the question was sort of the idea of hypocrisy, because we're talking about change and yeah. um, and creating a safe, safe spaces and, and the sort of places that we'd like to go clubbing. And I think it's really important that our Samantha and both Hannah made reference to that it's not just all talk, that actually those spaces do happen and perhaps sharing some of our experiences uh, like this and in other forums will, will enable that to happen. But but yeah, I frequently looked out from the DJ booth and thought, oh, right, we need help over there. And okay? there. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Uh, so there are a couple of more questions. Um, there's uh, some really beautiful questions from Leela. And she's asking, do you find you have a relationship with silence? Do you feel there is nourishment for us all in music to bathe in the silence? I feel like the pandemic has forced us to look at the subtle support systems. Who'd like to answer that first? Samantha, should we go to you? Yeah, I'm, I'm thinking, I'm thinking. <laughs> so yeah, like it's a, it's a good question. It's something I've been thinking about a lot uh, in the last 12 months because I've been taking a step back, yes, but at the same time, um, I I figure out how much like my comfort zone, the, the music is my escapism. So when I put my headphones on and when I make music, like 
everything around me kind of stops and all the problems go away and it's just like it's a it's a beautiful thing to have but once again double-edged weapon in a way you know in a way it's easy just to kind of like uh, put the headphones on, everything disappears and uh, you feel fine and all the problems go away, you know. So uh, um, in terms of silence, like um, it's it's something that definitely I'm working on and like also realizing that perhaps I don't have these breaks enough. Uh, it's already a step forward, but it's something that I'm definitely... Um, working on at the moment so it's it's so important so by silence i mean uh, not just uh, silence i, I mean this disconnection from uh, your work so it's something yeah it's it's a work in progress for sure but it's it's going okay <laughs> yeah and i think the silence you can read slowing down can't you as well like you say and disconnection that that actually allows time for reflection that perhaps when we're connected to the music and it's busy we, we don't get Hannah, you had something to say about that as well. Yeah, I, I find that um, when I, if I go out for, if I walk my dog or if I go out to have a run or if I just go to the shops or something, I'll, I won't take my phone with me um, and I won't listen to music while I'm doing those things because it gives, A, gives my ears a chance to rest and B, you're just kind of, yeah, you get that moment of silence, which I think is is so important to sort of connect to hearing just, I mean, definitely over the, the last year, I've kind of heard birds more and things like that, you know, like it's so important to like tap into like just stuff like na the natural world as well. Um, yeah, I love silence. I think as well like in such a fast paced society that we live where we're constantly projecting into the future. I think the silence and the now and actually like just reconnecting off uh, with the surroundings is so important to slow down and like benef benefits your well-being mental health etc so yeah 100 percent super important but and i just want to add actually that silence can be quite scary if it comes fast and if it's been a place because some people have grown up with a place of silence actually not being somewhere that that they want to be at all so actually it's something to kind of approach gently isn't it as well or it can be to sort of bring the silence more gently yeah so there's just one last question, which I thought was really interesting from Emma Barham. Um, what needs to change, what, what needs to change to make the industry inclusive for women, which I think we've been talking a lot about. Um, the second question is, how does childcare care of older relatives get accommodated in this industry? Kind of feels like Annie Mack taking a break and change has highlighted this potential incompatibility. Um, who'd like to lead on that? I think this is a really important topic. Uh, well, I, I can uh, take up the childcare uh, part of that question, as I have two little ones who seem to be 10 and 12. Um, I think it's hugely important. I think it can accommodate, I think the industry can accommodate it, but I think it requires massive organisation, a lot of support, um, and that's not always possible. Um, so I think support networks hugely important in terms of and, and fostering those and and um, not being afraid to ask for help. Um, again, really important in terms of your own well-being in trying to work and also um, one of the most important jobs, which is making sure your kids are OK. I'm on the board of an organisation called the F List for Music and um, motherhood and parenting um, in the music industry is one of the big areas that, that they're looking at. So um, I haven't prepped anyone to, you know, you know, for that link to come up in the chat. But if you Google the F List for Music, um, it was founded by a really extraordinary woman called Vic Bain. Um, who has also conducted um, a, a major survey on the music industry and how women are positioned and how women's careers um, are kind of promoted and how they're able to go grow through the industry. Um, so, yeah, Google Vic Bain and Google the F list for music and do get in touch with her because um, she is all manner of wisdom on this topic.
Um, I, just, I just want to say yeah. actually before we move on and perhaps we should ask yeah. Hannah quickly about um, caring for older relatives but I just wanted to say that I've been in interviews with big big name male DJs who have been juggling childcare as well so I've heard sort of little voices pop up in the middle, middle of radio interviews and you know that somebody who you perhaps wouldn't imagine is just so I think that's across the board for um, everybody involved in the industry that it it it's not, I think it actually relates to what we've been saying, which is speaking out loud about the things that we are experiencing um, um, in a way that is more open and perhaps more visible than it has been in the past might be really helpful because I think there's often been a, oh, look, they, there's no children visible or no childcare visible or no, you know, nothing seems to be, you know, a, a trou troubling. Um, and that can come across on social media in terms of pictures and things. It just doesn't look like real life. But actually speaking about real experiences means that people know, oh, OK, they're juggling, too. And actually it is possible, but it needs to it requires this, this and this. Yeah. Yeah, that's a that's a that's a really great point. And I, and I think a lot of the time because, um, you know, at working as a DJ, a musician, you are the sort of free freelance kind of mm. um, partner if, if there is a partnership and so a lot of the childcare ends up with the person who is is the more freelance whether that's a man or a woman or whatever um so yeah just more discussion about it is just what's needed isn't it? um in terms of like el elderly care i mean with m my own situation um my father cares for my mum so um that's yeah i i'm i'm not at this point gonna be a primary carer although I, I will because of my flexibility and that I'm not full-time you know working as such at the moment I am going to be helping out a lot more over the next couple of months for sure yeah all right well thank you so much I'm going to hand this back over now to Nimone um, to do some closing on this panel and then I'll be leading you to the after party so the main over to you oh listen i just wanted to say thanks again bishy terry emma and the team behind the scenes at which as well and um hannah and samantha again for sharing your experiences so generously and openly there are a selection of resources which we've gathered between us and there are more great resources so here is the slide of the resources um that you can see on the witch website but there are more uh, on the actual website than you can see on this slide for support, help and further reading about some Can you hear me? Should I say that again? Uh, do head to the Witch website for more um, and I, I wanted to say thank you to all of you for participating and joining us and I will be with Samantha and Hannah for a bit at the after party um, so we'll welcome Bishy back to say some more about how you can join in. Yeah, here we go. After online after party, um, but do head head to the Witch website because we only touched on a, uh, a very small proportion of the resources that are available um, on the website. Thank you. Hi everyone. So the uh, joining instructions for the art party in Topia should be in the chat now. I believe that you're all able to um, save the chat if you wish. I can see that it's been particularly lively. So I'm really looking forward to read all of that through. Um, tomorrow, um, please do join me where I will be leading a panel um, in conversation with Kayla Painter, Hannah Peel and Laurie Anderson. Yes, I still can't believe she said yes, um, but that's going to be wonderful. And we're going to be sharing intergenerational stories about creativity and technology. I've been really into researching this, like every waking hour for the past couple of weeks has just been watching Laurie Anderson YouTubes and just listening to her and absorbing her. So um, it's, uh, it's a pretty big deal for me. Um, so I, I really do hope you join us tomorrow. I'd like to thank again all of the panellists, Nimone, Samantha and Hannah. I'd like to thank Nali and Lula for their beautiful pieces. Um, thank you to the audience for staying with us so faithfully for the past couple of hours. I really hope to chat to some of you in Topia. 
And uh, last of all, I'd like to thank our sponsors, the PRS Foundation, the Featured Artists Coalition, Ableton, The Rattle, The Creative Passport. I'd love to thank Terry and Emma and Bella and Julia and Andy and everybody behind the scenes for coming together and making this one of the happiest experiences of my career. Thank you so much. Thank you. Good night. See you in Topia.